morning to all of you. Let me have the pleasure of uh, welcoming today's guest of honor uh, and uh, uh, you know the, uh, one of the most sought after persons in, in the corporate world, not just in India but also across the globe. And I'll tell you why you know she's most sought after, uh, uh, Srimad Shiv Shankar, for this wonderful lecture. And uh, she's going to be talking uh, to all of us on the new age essentials of leadership. And before we, uh, when she begins her uh, uh, interaction with all of you, let me have the pleasure of uh, introducing her. And uh, she comes with a very interesting and very illustrious career. She has worked in only three companies, but then the, those three companies, I think, uh, have been very, very illustrious. And before she started working, she did her uh, BA in computer science from NIT, where she also got a distinguished alumni award from her alma mater, NIT Trichy. And after which she went on to do her uh, uh, MBA from uh, University of Ohio uh, between 1992 and 94. And very interestingly, immediately after her uh, post graduation, that is an MBA, you know, she became an entrepreneur. She was an independent business owner for her own company called uh, Trichinopoly Mining Works between January 1995 uh, and January 1999. After that, it was just a corporate career. And like I said, she just worked in three companies, but very, very dusty. The first one was uh, at uh, uh, DSQ, DSQ Software, where she was the head of talent strategy between 99, May 99 and December 2001. After that, she spent close to about nine years, precisely eight years and 11 months, if I have to be precise, in Infosys. First, as a senior consultant at their very, very well-known Infosys Leadership Institute between Jan 2002 and November 2006. After that, she became principal diversity officer, which I think is one that she has been championing from those days till now. And that is between number 2006 and number 2010. After that, you know, from December 2010 till now, she has been working with uh, in, uh, HCL, HCL uh, Technologies. First, uh, she joined uh, them as uh, AVP in HCL Technologies, then she became VP, then uh, uh, Executive Vice President in October uh, uh, 2017. And since uh, October 2019 onwards, she is the Corporate Vice President of, uh, 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 and also head of uh, uh, New Vistas at HCL uh, uh, Technologies. And most importantly, she also, apart from her corporate uh, life she, uh, right, and responsibilities, she also was uh, the task force member, of course, in the uh, various uh, multiple uh, uh, years, uh, at both international and uh, national organization. And if you look at uh, international, uh, uh, you know, the task force membership, she was a task force member at UN uh, Women, then the Global Reporting Initiatives, and also the world famous World Economic Forum. And if you look at her uh, uh, the task force membership in India, she was a task force member at uh, uh, CIA as well as an ESCOM. And uh, in 2021, she was awarded the world's prestigious uh, Weekwal uh, Award in 2021. And very strangely, this uh, institution, it's a global institution which is started by uh, Katie Litchfield and which promotes uh, equality and uh, you know uh, the diversity across Fortune 500 companies and other global companies. And in fact, that institution was started in 2019 and uh, she received that award in 2021 itself. And that uh, tells uh, all of us, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the volumes about her kind of uh, pioneering work in the area of uh, diversity and also uh, uh, you know, uh, promoting women to the corporate world and especially at the top economics of the corporate world. And um, also, she has a beautiful uh, habit of writing, and uh, I have seen her writing, and I encourage all of you to also see her blog, and it has been extremely well. And uh, we will have the pleasure of listening to her on this wonderful topic. And uh, before she begins, uh, I just wanted to product. Calls. One is that uh, we request all of you to put your question uh, in the Q and A box so that we can relay the same question to her, and she will have uh, uh, the, uh, no, she will uh, respond towards and the Fed. And also, second thing is that uh, any question that you have, not necessarily to do with uh, the topic, but also anything that you think uh, you can pick it up from her uh, illustrious career, uh, and is most welcome. Right. With this uh, 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 two protocols, let me have the pleasure of uh, welcoming Srimati to this wonderful platform. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Nagendra, and uh, good evening to everyone who's joined this. Um, I feel really privileged to spend a, an awesome Saturday evening with all of you. Um, I have uh, with me Shweta, who's my colleague from HCL, and um, she'll be helping me also to moderate the sessions and, and the slides that I have put together. 
Um, so, uh, Shweta, if you can put the deck. Um, you know, the very interestingly, you know, the topic that was given to me was uh, the new age uh, of leadership. I think um, in I think 2020 onwards, uh, we I think we are at crossroads. There's so many things that are happening um, in uh, in leadership um, in organizations. And I really want to uh, bring across uh, my uh, insights, um, more importantly, uh, my own experience as to how you can focus on organization and uh, leadership in the coming years. Um, you know, I might uh, sound like I belong to the Gen X uh, in the 90s. I know a lot of you are probably Gen Millennials and Gen Z, uh, but what is most important is that uh, um, I'm going to share what we can learn from the past and what is going to be the future and how you can adopt some of the principles now. Um, so I'm just trying to um, not bring the concepts that I have uh, learned, but what I believe have worked well for me. So anything that I quote is purely from my, my own experience. So bear with me and if you have any questions and I always welcome uh, questions uh, that might also challenge uh, some of my own insights. That's the way I can learn as well. Um, and so the way I've structured this, I have just about nine slides. I'm not very good with preparing law um, and you know uh, multiple slides. I learned to at a very young age that if you cannot strike oil within the first three minutes of drilling, stop drilling because it gets very expensive. So I like to keep it short, about nine slides and all. Um, and um, it would take about 20, 25 minutes and post which I would like to open the floor for a lot of questions. Um, questions, comments, suggestions, anything around the essentials of leadership. Next slide, Shweta. What's happening today in the world? I think uh, most importantly with the the digital age, uh, you know, so much has been talked about digital age, but let me just limit to what's happening in the organizations, what's happening from the management and uh, the leadership perspective. We are shifting from what is called a typical pyramid to a distributed form for agility and innovation. Uh, this era of gig workers, we have people from different nationalities working together. The workplace doesn't matter. It's the end output that matters. So as a result of which the responsibility of the leader is no longer pyramid based, but it is very, it is very distributed. Everyone is accountable for themselves. Everyone is accountable for the end deliverables that you need to focus on. And therefore it is important for a leader to know that he's not the leader, he's only an orchestrator and he has to bring that leadership element in each one of his or her team members and make the goals um, you know, come together and achieve the end results. So there is a natural shift in the thought of the definition of a leader and who the leader is in an organization. Everyone is a leader, but then in this democracy, how does a leader need to orchestrate to bring the results? I think that will be the focus of our discussion today. And I would bring a very interesting concept called the balanced leadership, uh, which is needed to not to tilt the pyramid, not to skew the uh, distributed network, but orchestrate it in such a way that you, know, you are able to go in rhythm and you know, bring what is needed. You know, when I, when I was about to start this session, my colleague, uh, Vinit, uh, you know, yeah, he's, 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 he reads a lot. So he pushed a message to me saying, Shumiti, I just read recently, a Harvard professor has mentioned that, uh, um, you know, a leader has to be both a plumber and a poet, which is so true because plumber or orchestrates with a lot of tools. Poet has to orchestrate with a lot of words. But most importantly, creativity and problem solving becomes two hands uh, to, to a leader and, and we need to use at this point in time. But how does he or, she or he or she orchestrate this and make the being a plumber or being a poet, getting across to the various people in the organization becomes very, very important. And therefore, I think 
we all know that change is inevitable. Change happens every day. It's talked so much. But most of the time, the leaders just stand back to say, who's going to do the first step to make the change? But if you are a kind of a person who likes to embrace change first and then move forward, then you are already understanding the distributed leadership. And you know the team is with you because the team believes that when you take an, uh, the first step to embrace change, that they, they will also need to change their ways of working. So two thoughts to today, you know, in the first slide before I move to first to the next, uh, you know, next set of, uh, you know, concepts is that we are moving to distributed leadership. That is most important to bring agility. It's important to know that there is no longer a leader sitting in the pyramid, the top of the pyramid, but the leaders are your own team members. But who is supposed to be a leader from the hierarchy perspective? His or her job is basically to orchestrate, enable change, and enthuse and energize people to bring agility and innovation. By doing so, are you inclusive? Is, is what we are all worried about. I think equal and equitable, it is not to do with gender, but it is basically the values. We need to start pushing more and more from the leadership perspective, the values that you need to uphold. But when you look at values, are you equal and equitable? I think these are two terms that we should often, you know, question and say where we are. Um, Shweta, to next slide. So very often, you know, there is this uh, confusion of the feminine and masculine. Everybody believes bringing women into the organization means you're promoting diversity and that is gender inclusion. No, not at all. I think we have to shift that thought completely and go to, a, to an understanding of how do you balance energies. That's a first step to having a balanced leadership. That's the first ideology in what I would call it as the new age leadership. So, you know, we all know the yin yang, right? But then in the organization, the yin and the yang need to go hand in hand. The fundamental masculine is all about giving and for the feminine, it is all about receiving. That's, that's, that's a basic element or basic gender balance that you need to bring. We say masculine form of organization, feminine form of organization. Um, but today we need to balance the masculine and feminine form of organization. How are the rules defined? How are the rules being implemented? How are the rules being embraced in order for you to work successfully in the organization would de determine whether you are into masculine or into feminine side of you know, way of working. Um, let us just look at uh, the, um, the masculine way of approaching, you know, it is very linear and pretty analytical. Um, so there is a passion, but somewhere the compassion is forgotten. When the passion holds hands with compassion, that is where the feminine part of the, man, uh, of the organization comes into picture. In a room of decision making, are you being consultative or are you consensus driven? Or you're going to be directed. The directive is more a masculine way. A consultative way will come more on a feminine way. Are you just going to the room and asking for numbers? Hey guys, pick up your balance, uh, your Excel sheets. Show me all the analysis. Let me look at the numbers. Let me first look at the trees before I see the forest. And that's where the masculine energy comes. comes. But when you go in a little bit of intuition, see the trees, see the bigger forest before you see the trees and have a little vision and then say, hey, you know what, let me drill down and validate what I believe was coming out of my intuition with certain data points, then that is where would be, we call it you having a feminine energy trait. Organizations are built with by people and people are you and leaders are you. So it's very important for you to understand how do you need to balance your masculine and feminine energy. Many times people ask me, is aggression being masculine and is assertive being uh, feminine? It's not so. It's nothing to do with being aggressive or about assertive, but it's, it's about how you communicate your decision. Are you going to be directive or are you going to 
get people to also participate before you actually deliver the results or deliver the direction. I think that's what would make someone or an organization make it uh, uh, driven by a masculine energy or through a feminine energy. Many countries today can embrace the masculine and feminine form. Um, it has nothing to do with who the ruler is. Uh, there are people who ask me, ma'am, I mean, if you have, um, you know, the prime minister or the president of the country being a woman, does that mean it's, it's, you're driven, it's, a, it's a feminine country? No, not at all. It's about how the country is being run, just like the way organizations are run. Balance is most, most needed today. And that is why I thought I must put some time around this slide and explain to you that the organizations need to balance. And it's nothing to do with the percentage of women or percentage of men or percentage of all the other diversity in the, in the workplace. Next slide. So you need to think beyond gender, like I, I, I just said uh, earlier. I think traditionally, you know, uh, the men have been the hunter gatherers and the women have been traditional nurturers. So somewhere having a gender diversity within the organization also brings the element of nurturing an element of natural coaching, counseling, and the human side. It's very natural. You know, we may debate whether this is applicable for this generation or not. It may be an age old thought, not so. It's because psychologically, this is how we have been construed and we have been raised. So there is a natural way that, you know, um, how the hunter gatherer and, tra and traditional nurturers can work together. A leader needs to balance both. We need to be a hunter. We need to look, look for our revenues. We are focused on our, our bottom line. We are focused on mar margins. But are we nurturing people along the way to take them along to get the revenue and the bottom line that is needed? I think that's most important at this point in time, especially because the organizations are distributed, leaders are distributed, work is distributed, and there are multi-generational workforce at this point in time in large organizations. Next slide, Trina. So the new mantra today is all about care. If you have noticed you know, on, on the right side, I, I have put the care as the new mantra. It's not a typical care, but I've used um, an abbreviation here. Courage, agility, empathy, and resilience. I'm sure you've heard this in so many times from so many of the other leaders. So I'm not going to dwell deep into it. But what's most important when you exhibit this is what I have put in the capital letters. You be, you be courageous, but be balanced. I think it's very important. Um, you, 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 you need to bring the feminine and masculine energy to show your balance when you are courageous. Um, it's not, not about being ruthless. It's not about cutting down cost overnight. It's not about throwing people outside, but it's always looking for alternate ways and applying your intuition to, to bring about and to show your courage when you deal with ambiguities. It is very important that you show your balance um, when you have to demonstrate courage. When you are going to be agile, be inclusive. There may be many people in the room who have a hard time in speaking up. They may not uh, be very quick on their feet, but you just can't leave them behind. I think agility is not about just looking at your performance, performance goals and putting at your performance improvement plan all the time. And it's not about acquisitions and mergers all the time to bring agility. Agility is about being inclusive. Is everyone involved in running the race with you? That an agile team wins but everyone in that team have to play their role in order for you to win. You just can't leave people behind. That's important. Empathy, I will talk a little about empathy in, 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 other, in some of the other slides. Empathy is be authentic. You need to, there is, there is, you know, I have had some of the conversations with both men and women in organizations. And, uh, you know, uh, very, many, many times people come and ask me, hey, you know, Srimati, I do not know how to handle when somebody cries in the room, appraisals have gone wrong, something has gone wrong. 
and the person is down. It's one of the low sodium days. And how do you actually show your empathy? Empathy is not about sympathizing. We all know that. But you genuinely care. I think any leader today should take some time and ask themselves this question. I'm not going to be prescriptive about being empathic because I learned it in a very hard way. I learned to practice it by demonstrating and asking people if I'm doing the right thing. So we cannot be prescriptive about being empathy. No books is going to teach you empathy. Experience is going to teach you empathy. And experience makes you go more authentic. So remember that books are not meant for you to learn and demonstrate empathy. And resilience is all about demonstrating trust. It's not about you know how you come back with difficulty, but when you get back from difficulty, um, do you demonstrate trust? And how do you build trust? That's very important. And I do have some examples for you as to how you could demonstrate trust. At this juncture, I want to just take a pause and also tell you that you know there are some examples that I'm going to bring today. They could be a little personalized. And you might think, hey, you know, why is this lady telling stories about her life? But then that is experience. And I think we learn through our own experiences. And it is important to connect the experiences to your real life. You cannot compartmentalize work from home, work from your personal life. Because many times how you behave in your personal life and situations is what makes you to think and work smartly, intelligently, proactively, with empathy, with courage, agility, and resilience at workplace. Both are interconnected, and you really cannot separate them both. That's one mantra I have learned, which I think I'm bold enough to share with you as well today. Next slide, Shweta. So um, way back, I have, I have told this many times because before, but then I keep telling this all the time. You know, I grew up in a small village and, you know, my household had grand uncles, aunts and everything, everybody. My grandmother used to wake up at four in the morning and, you know, being a South Indian, we all wake up with that coffee smell in the morning. But then she used to, you know, put a pot right out there for making rice. And from the, the larger rice pot, she used to transfer it to the to the cooker where she has to add water and cook rice. But while she was doing it, she always kept aside a handful of rice into a pot, into an earthen pot. And all the kids running around, she used to call all of us and say, now take a, take a fistful of rice and put it into the earthen pot. I found it very peculiar. Of course, I knew what she was doing with the pot. Every week she used to give, every week or every month, she used to give away to a temple locally because that, that was uh, used for distributing to the poor and the nearby. It was very, um, it was, it was to me, it is humility. It is about practicing mindfulness. There are many examples, a coach, a professional coach will tell you about practicing mindfulness, but this is being mindful. When you wake up in the morning and you want to do something, you are, you also bring a cause into your own work space. You don't separate the uh, work from what you would call it as community. You don't separate the ecosystem from yourself. It's very important when you run teams. It can't be me, myself, and my team. It is also about the larger ecosystem. It is important in an organization, if you are going to run only your own track and be successful only in your own track, and go and become a topper every day, nobody is going to make you feel good because they will say, hey, but then you are leaving the organization behind. Your organization is a larger ecosystem and you are like me, like my grandmother, one in the organization. And you need to, when you take care of yourself, you have to also say, how am I going to take care of my larger ecosystem? This is what is called as a crowdsourcing too. Now everyone talks about crowdsourcing. Everyone talks about what is that you can put aside every day towards your CSR, towards anything else. But then our ancestors have done this extremely well and they have managed famine. 
they have managed what I would call as the inflection points at work today when there is when there is recession and then suddenly you know we are not going to put money on the table then you should remember our ancestors have done it so well at home. Next slide, Shweta. And you know, there's so much talked about trust, you know, but you need to look at your own teams. You all need to work as teams today. Many of you are young and you are really ready to do well in your career. I think please understand that you need to work with teams and be with your teams to build your trust. What does it mean, you know? It's the same household, you know, when we all sit down on the table. I'm sure all of you are practicing this at home too. And food is served. And, um, you know, if your family is in such a way that all of you are going to go and help your spouse, your mom, um, you know, um, or your daughter who is inside uh, cooking, I think all of us are helping each other today's households are like that. We are not just leaving it to somebody to run the household. So we are all helping each other. And we come to the table to sit. We never ask who made this dish. Why is that salt is not there? We are really not worried about who, but we are more worried about, and, and we only comment on what could have got added to make it taste better. So I think there we do it so naturally, but at work, when something bad happens, you are more worried about who's done it. You want to pull that person out, but then all of us have gone through a professional development curriculum called working in teams per, and interpersonal skills, active listening, give and receive feedback. We, we read all that, but then when it really happens at the workplace, then the first question you ask yourself, you, yourself is, hey, which guy did it? Yeah, pull him out, you know? And I think I need to question him in front of everybody. That is the first step towards falling back on each other's trust. Conflict happens when you focus on the problem and not being part of the solution. I think it's very important to nurture trust. You need to demonstrate it. Just practice what you do at home. And, you know, today we all, among pandemic, we are working from home. I'm sure many of our organizations were worry, very worried about people delivering from home. Will, it, will they deliver? Will they be productive? But suddenly we had a common enemy called COVID. With a common enemy, we united and we started to trust each other. The customers also started to trust each other. What if you just didn't have a common enemy? Life goes on, but it's so important that you need to draw example from your household, how you trust each other and bring it to your workplace. Next slide. So I think I'm just gonna stop here. So today, I think I touched upon some of the topics about uh, balanced. Um, I, I talked about uh, being mindful, uh, trusting each other. Um, how do you actually start nurturing people while you're at uh, work? I think I, I brought some of these um, 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 aspects. There are three more um, aspects. I don't know, Shweta, it was there in the last slide, but I can't see it. If you can pull it out, um, Shweta. Shweta, if you can. Yes, yes see it. I'm just, just, just trying. Just give me a minute. Yeah. So there is this concept of letting go. Um, you know, Dr. Angindra, we have heard it a lot. You know, you should let go of things. A balanced leader, the new age leadership is all about letting, let go of things. You know, I learned this let go of things in a very natural way from my mother. Um, you know, whenever I was in crisis, when I grew up, um, when I was not able to reach uh, certain things, when I was not able to achieve certain things, or some kind of unexpected thing happened to me. I remember going to her and asking, Amma, why, is, why has this happened to me? Why me? And then she used to ask me, why not you, right? Why can't it happen to you? Or why do you always have to worry about why me, why me? Start asking, why not me? Then you are actually letting go of what negative impact the situation has on you and you start moving forward. I think it's, it's very important for us to understand how do you let go of things. Um, second is, there is always a question around stress. 
people keep saying, oh, especially this generation, we are all into digital. I mean, I'm also quite okay with social media. I do have my WhatsApp group, groups. Everyone is like totally stressed. I love this term. I mean, I, I talk to many of the young people and they say, Srimati, I'm totally stressed. I just don't know how to handle this. And they come up with a lot of acronyms about uh, various impact that is happening to them. I think uh, we just forget that the best way to handle stress is to talk it out to your own family members. You trust them. You trust them so well. Who else other than your own family can actually help you deal with situations? Your friends, maybe, but your friends may also be in a question uh, and in cross and also in crossroads. They may also have similar problem like you. Your best sounding board in the whole world when you have stress and you are stressed about work is to have your own family. Spend quality time with them and not about quantity. I'm sure all of you will accept today, post pandemic has taught us that you can spend time at home and still be productive. We never did it when we were going to office every day. But now I think with all of us returning to office, we should still be you know, practicing how much time, how the quality time you want to spend with your parents with your spouse, with your pets. I think that's very, very important. And most importantly is the me space. I keep telling this again. How many of you run every day, exercise every day? Do you take that 30 minutes as a leader, as youngsters, whoever is in the room, do you take that 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and practice something that you love most, that will energize you most? Because if you lose out on some stuff which energizes you today, you will look back after 10 years and say, man, I really missed out on something that I liked a lot. Liked a lot. I'm, I just want to get back to it, but I don't know how to get back to it because I don't have time now. So the concept of time and I don't have time now irritates you, especially if you don't spend time on certain things which are very close to your heart. Do something that's very close to your heart. And I have one final say for all of us in this room. Have a purpose. Have a purpose in life. When you have a purpose and you feel happy about the purpose, then the rest of the leadership around the balanced leadership follows. A balanced leader is somebody who understands the purpose for, for his work, a purpose to live. In order to do that, you need to unlearn and learn every day. You must be open to learning. The more you unlearn, the more you learn every day, unlearn and learn, you will discover your purpose in a much better fashion and start taking everybody's help uh, to, to be a better leader. And, uh, and I think, I think it's maybe very philosophical. I'm sorry, I don't want to be philosophical, but it's most importantly is pick up a piece of paper and write down what makes you happy. And you write down and, and, and you will know and you read it. What makes you happy is the, is the very essence of the, of, uh, of the purposefulness in life. So write down and in a piece of paper, what makes me happy? And I think that's very important. And that is the fundamental of being a balanced leader. The yin and yang is all about having purpose and staying happy. So let me wish all of you good luck, uh, loads of uh, happiness, loads of, uh, you know, uh, I would say success and be balanced, stay balanced. Uh, that will make a lot of difference. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nagendra and friends. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Srimadhi. I mean, amazing the thoughts. I think uh, I won't so definitely just to uh, correspond to what he said, I think when people fail to understand reality, they say it's a philosophy. So it's no longer philosophy, <laughs> definitely. And then with your permission, I have a few questions uh, from all the participants. Uh, Srimati, if I can uh, take uh, and uh, relay those questions to you. Can I? Sure, sir. Yeah, okay. So the first one is uh, from Shyam Babu Shah. And uh, his question is, hi, ma'am, good evening. I'm from IT background, working in Accenture. What are the areas we should focus to move to leadership role? Thank you, Shab. Uh, sorry, you ask uh, that question again, Dr. Rakindra? Yeah. Uh, I, audio in, 
Yeah, uh, his question is, uh, I'm from IT background, uh, working in Accenture. What are the areas we should focus to move to leadership role? Right. I think I answered quite a bit today. Um, I think most important for you is to stay focused. Put down your goals in a piece of paper. If you want to be a leader, leader is not about, if you believe it's going about, it's about hierarchy and you want to go up the ladder, don't shy about saying that. I think Dr. Nagendra, many of us shy away saying that in five years, I want to be a CEO of the company. I think the young leaders in this room shouldn't feel worried at all about it because the opportunities are there, so many. And if you want to put it, if you want to be a fast tracker, then start working and don't shy away. I think it's very, very important for you to put down in a piece of paper, I am going to be so-and-so in three years, five years, seven years. Stay focused and you will achieve it. And don't get worried about what people say. That's most important when you want to stay focused and run. You know, I always say there are three kinds of people in the world. There is this end, there is this long tunnel and you're asked to run in the tunnel. There are people who wait at the, for a light at the end of the tunnel to start running. There are people who will say, can I have a torchlight? Can I have this? Can I have that? Before they start running into the tunnel. There are people who will say, no, no, can three people join me up? Then I will run into the tunnel. A leader, first of all, should know, or a person who wants to become a leader should know what kind of personality he or she is. Are you a risk taker? Are you a person who needs to be equipped with certain characteristics and behaviors before you believe that you want to become a leader? Or do you always need to be supported before you become a leader? So I think you need to define your personality and then write down your goals and start running. Thank you, uh, Simit. I think uh, you know that's a wonderful insight for the shop. And then we have uh, the next question from Tejas Rane. And uh, you know, his uh, uh, thoughts are great thoughts for young leaders like us, ma'am. Can you please talk about executive stroke leadership resilience? Thank you, Tejas. On the leadership resilience? Uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, executive stroke leadership presence. Executive or leadership presence? E executive or uh, a leadership presence. Okay, so in what context, uh, Dr. Nagendra? Because this is like a. Uh, uh, Tejas, if you can uh, uh, do that, because uh, I don't want to misinterpret uh, your question in any case. So yeah. uh, if you can uh, you know, rephrase, maybe we'll come back to the question. So let me go to the next question, uh, Srimati, if that's okay with you. Sure. And uh, next question is from uh, Padmaja. And her question is very simple, but very powerful seems to be. And her question is, how do I find purpose in life? <laughs> very, I told you the very simple way. It's just that write down what makes you happy. Right. And um, and also look at yourself today and see what you're doing. Is it making you happy? Right. If it's making you happy, then what you're doing today is part of your purpose. Um, purpose keeps changing. Sometimes it is very dynamic. Uh, you don't need to worry. But what's most important is when you wake up in the morning and you feel good about yourself, then what you're doing is right. And what you're doing is part of the purpose that you're really searching for. That's the easiest to do. Very good. Now, this is a long question from Balaji Nayaka. And his question is, we all acknowledge the book written by Mr. Vineet Nayar, sir, employees first and customer second. Can you elaborate more about this since we always hear about uh, customer is king and uh, uh, no importance for employees as there is no more uh, said about anyone other than HCL about employees. Thank you, Balaji. Very interesting question. Yeah. Thanks, Balaji. You may want to read the book in detail. Vineet is the best to narrate. But I think one of the most important tenets of this uh, is inverting the pyramid. Um, because we do believe that the people who are front-ending the customer or who is interacting with the customer are my frontline employees. And they are the ones who would constantly need to innovate and solve the customer problems. So the way we have worked in HCL is to build our own policies and structures, which will enable the 
set of people who are front ending the customer for day to day solving problems. So that is the inverting pyramid concept. I think that's where the employees first, customer second uh, philosophy actually, or the culture actually stemmed. Um, so it's not about employee first and customer second. It's actually inverting the pyramid to enable and empower employees to service the customers better. And it's not top down, but it is driven by a set of employees who will need all the enablement to make our customer service far, far superior than what we were doing otherwise. So that's that's more a nudge that he gave to the organization way back in uh, in the in 2009. Thank you, uh, uh, Srimati. In fact, uh, Balaji, I think uh, you will find a lot of anecdotal evidences in that book about how you know the, the you know the you know the, the germination of this idea has taken place, and uh, you will find very very thoughtful and very very. I would say rebellious ideas also as to how you know this uh, thought has come. Then this is the next question from Amit uh, Srimati, and his question is: uh, Hello, ma'am. Being visionary lead, uh, uh, visionary as leader is essential, but how to develop that skill with some examples? And, se and his second question is: uh, How to develop uh, uh, the skill of open-ended questions continuously and uh, helpful if uh, any, you know if you can uh, quote any example? Sure. I think uh, to to do any to start with your vision exercise, I think the most important point is put a question called why. Why am I doing this? Why is this project for? Uh, why do you have to use this tool? Why should I work in this problem? Why this team? Why this company? I think many times. We forget this concept of why. We go directly to what, when, and where. So we are taught, most of the times the Indians are taught to jump into what rather than why. Many vision exercise actually starts with why. Then only you start talking about objectives, mission, and stuff like that, right? But most importantly, is a concept called why. The more you start putting this question why on everything you do, you'll find that automatically you're being pushed to, um, you know, thinking like a leader. And thinking at a little higher, I would call it as a macro level at a helicopter, having a helicopter view. You see the forest before you start counting trees. Seeing the forest first is a vision. And I think that will come more and more out of practice to start putting this question why ahead of everything else. Second is your open-ended questions. There is a format exercise for these questions. You start with why, what, when, how, what else. This is called a format exercise. Start using it more and more. Whenever why, if you want to write a beautiful letter, your email etiquette, don't be all over. Start with why, then move to what, then move to how, and then when and what else. So to be purposeful in anything that you drive, it's not just about open-ended question, but most importantly, having a structure in the way that you want to put across your questions. And I just taught you a concept called format. Thank you. Uh, and this is a question from uh, Shiv Metal, and his question is, uh, Madam, as you were talking about uh, yin and yang, I was wondering, how did you manage the bias, if any, in your organization? What was your mantra to overcome the bias? Thank you, Shiv. <laughs> Thank you for that question. There's always an un unconscious bias. The organization may not have, but the people may have. Right? If we close our eyes and then I call out a word called nurse, I'm sure 99% of this, including girls in this room, will only think of a woman behind a nurse. And if I close my eyes and say, Oh, in, and, um, you know, a um, uh, uh, bus driver, right? Immediately, 99% of this room will only associate a male behind a bus driver, right? So these are all un un unconscious bias. Um, you know, have you looked at your building block? Have you ever seen a pink or a purple block in your building block? Never, because pink and purple cannot get into a building block. Because somebody who made it decided that it can only be of those strange colors of an yellow, green, and so on, right? And even blue, but never a pink. So these are all unconscious biases on which we have been working on many days. So let first of all, I do accept that there are unconscious bias. 
but my job is not to change everyone my job is to focus on the goals given to me and do it successfully i don't differentiate between male and female colleagues i focus on the end deliverables end of the day if you know what you're doing and you're able to demonstrate courage in what you do i don't think the organization or your own peers feel that you're different from them so it's all about demonstrating sincerity integrity and being courageous about the work that you do i would i would call upon all women and men in this room that in if there may be an ecosystem which has unconscious bias the only way for you to change them or change the ecosystem is you focus on end deliverables not worry about the ecosystem thank you uh, and this is a question from ashish moitra and his uh, question is respect ma'am thank you for your lessons related to leadership with an ethnocentric orientation uh, that is about family please elaborate in the area in the era of nuclear family how we continue to balance the yin and yang uh, leadership in the disruptive era of technology thank you ashish <laughs> yes uh, the nucleus families are going to be more and more but um, are you picking up the phone in the morning and checking on your parents that matters checking on your siblings at some point in time uh, that really matters sometimes you also have your own friends who can be your close family too so i think the nuclear family means that you are you're like a branch office your headquarters is still your 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 own home from where you have created a branch so it's how well connected you are to your headquarters matters right dr nagendra we all live in our apartments but it doesn't mean that once a year during diwali or around sankranti we all pack our bags and go home do you pick up your phone and check on your mom your dad and whenever they want to talk to you do you get out of your regular office hours and speak to them you're still connected it doesn't mean you need to be there physically nobody is asking nuclear family or joint family is no longer about living under the same house to do with your values if your values is all about fam bringing family and being little in touch with your own roots then you're still joint in your mind physical separation does not really make somebody feel alienated and away uh, from uh, from being part of the family so remember that thank you and uh, this is a question from uh, 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 anurag sharma and his question is many thanks ma'am for wonderful sharing i would like to understand what leaders must do to listen to the person standing uh, last in the orchestra and trust or value as much as they trust or value the first uh, the person uh, uh, near to them thank you so much anurag very thoughtful question only when you stand on a podium you are able to differentiate between the first and the last a leader cannot stand in the podium those days are gone a leader should be there somewhere in the middle and no longer can you have a classroom you need more round tables you need to king think like king arthur so it's not about the first and the last that matters i think it's about you being in the center you need to be there amidst your teams that is what a distributed network is all about if you are going to be authoritative then you can you only see the last person based on the structure you have formed but if you are going to be right there in the ground with the others everyone is there in the ground and it's not about the first or the last because you reach out you are able to walk across and talk to them only if you sit in the podium you have to get down in the steps and walk but if you are there in the ground you can just walk across remember that that's most important are you a leader who stands on the podium or are you a leader who is pretty much on the floor with the ground in the ground with your own teams then that question will get answered automatically thank you and uh, this is a question from bhumika singh and her question is hello ma'am being soft spoken and too sensitive is the biggest hurdle in my leadership to sort this to sort this problem i try to keep communications restricted to work which again raises concerns like people think i'm not a team player so how to overcome this thank you bhumika bhumika continue to be soft 
<laughs> Continue to be soft. Don't change. You don't need to change your personality just because somebody asks you to say so. What's most important is stay assertive. Speak up when you have to. There are many people who speak very less. It's also because of your own personality type. And it's important to speak up when you get an opportunity, when you are given an opportunity. Because at the end of the day, you don't need to feel like a doormat. So don't, the minute you feel like a doormat is when you become passively aggressive at some point in time and you walk away. So please, please be soft. Continue to be who you are. But what's most important is you must speak up when you get an opportunity. You have in a room and the leader says, hey, do you have an idea? Throw the idea. If even if they, they won't ask you, you get up and say, I have an idea. I think when the opportunities are there, you should speak up. You don't need to speak all the time. Just because you have team members who are like talkative and who are extremely energetic, it doesn't mean you have to show your energy by talking all the time. Talk when it is needed. And then your words will be valued. Thank you, uh, 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 Srimati. And this is a question, long question from Angela Nadiodi. And her question is, ma'am, women who want to reach the leadership position face a lot of challenges from their male, male uh, colleagues. It is understood that men's, uh, men in grey suit uh, do not accept the fact that the women uh, would do much better in the leadership role. Despite having their capabilities and the academic background, they still find it difficult. How was your experience on this front? What would be your advice for a woman, who, a woman to reach to this leadership position? Thank you, Angela. <laughs> Angela, I, you know, many people have asked me this too. Um, you know, I, uh, I was a sports person uh, when I grew up. Um, I love sports even till today, but don't practice much, unfortunately. I, though I tell people you should do what is very close to your heart. Sometimes I have also given up and still get back. I used to run and in my uh, village, Dr. Nagendra, it was a co-education, right? And you need to run based on your height, right? <laughs> That's how they, they, they grew, right? And I always ended up running with boys because being a tall girl. And um, somehow I found I was actually much better than boys in running. Uh, maybe because I wanted to run, right? Because I enjoyed running. I remember one day my coach, when I was in grade five, I remember my coach telling me, uh, you know, he said, you know, why are you in self-doubt? You seem to be standing in the corner with a self-doubt about whether you can run well or not. And because people are watching you and people who are watching you are all boys because you are the only girl who seemed to be running in the ground. But when you run, you should run towards your goalpost. You are running your 100 meter dash and you need to say the finishing line. You're not here to worry about who is running in your side track, who is running behind. It could be a male, it could be a female, it could be a person from a very different background. When you run in, in, the, in your race track, you're more worried about the purpose for which you're running, not about people who are running with you. It comes with a lot of practice, Angela, I agree. It might look like, you know, uh, like I'm preaching, but what my coach, what my humble teacher from a small town taught me, trying to make me believe in myself. And it's nothing to do with gender. It is about your own self-confidence and your purpose about why you're doing something. If you want to succeed in your career, it's in your hands. No one else can assist you. So Angela, just get started. Most importantly, get started on this and say, how am I just going to not worry about what people are saying and just, just start working around the situations. You will be lucky at times to be successful. Leverage that part of being lucky and then move forward. Thank you. Uh, and with your permission, I think we already shot, uh, you know, uh, pa we are past uh, seven o'clock, uh, 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 Srimati. With your permission, I'll take three more questions if that's okay with you. Right? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So the next question is from Pranjal Gupta and uh, his question is, hello, ma'am. Thanks for such thoughtful uh, presentation on such critical topic in simplified manner and connecting with your own experiences. 
please share your views on how to balance your leadership trait a leadership trait with your uh, seniors seniors when they are not opposite extreme for example my trait is uh, yin but the senior is a strong yang <laughs> <laughs> thank you pranjal <laughs> Oh my God, that's like I can write a book around it. <laughs> I think that's a complimentary kind of thing. Uh, you find. <laughs> yeah, it it is very difficult. <laughs> it's dangerous too, right? <laughs> so I want. I'm very curious about what his skip level is. Maybe my my immediate manager is is a yang and I'm a yin. But <laughs> how is his manager? I mean, the, I would say the the skip level. if he is also the same then you're really you know it is it is just not a place for you i must tell you right um let me just uh, put it in a very serious manner none of us can be happy at work if you are values are being if you have a values conflict remember that it's not about money it's about your values conflict that's why i spoke a lot about values today values that you believe in and the values that you want to promote you cannot be happy if you have a manager or a, a skip level manager who has values completely different from you and believes different from you i don't want to be very uh, cynical about it but don't get up in the morning feeling little threatened about your own values it's not the right thing don't battle with people who don't want to change change you don't want to take on small battles and feel small you want to take a big war and you win i think it's very important know your battles know what you want to fight for but don't change your beliefs and value system that's my sincere request i don't have a prescription for you but you you will need to do a introspection about your own feelings Thank you. And the last, uh, second last question from Siddharth Prasad. And his question is: uh, Good evening, ma'am. What would you want to say if a person wants to start his own venture? Any specific, uh, any specific things to focus on? Also, there may be decisions which would be right, and some would be wrong. How can we be fully accurate while dealing with our own business? Thank you, Siddharth. You know, if you are a kind of a person, if you start running the race track and you fall. in the race track if you are going to wait for somebody to come and lift you from the race track then you are not fit to be an entrepreneur if you fall down and you get up on your own and you wipe your face and then start walking straight then you are fit to be an entrepreneur so first decide if you don't you know whether you are okay to fall down many times and still you will get up on your own and run and uh, number 2 is uh, are you okay to be criticized and face a lot of rejections an entrepreneur initially in india though i know there are a lot of startups not every startup gets successful in the first initial years you need the right breakthrough you do need right mentorship you need financing so you need to also know that you will have a lot of rejections are you okay to feel rejected and if you are not going to feel dejected by such rejections then you are fit to be an entrepreneur look at these two qualities to start with um, your ideas and how to get your funding and how to get your team all that are more to do with the um, you know the the yang the yin part that i talked about the yang part is all about being intuitive and know yourself before you get to become an entrepreneur that's my sincere request and the last question for today evening session uh, uh sympathy is from soumya and her question is hi ma'am how to deal with toxic people as no matter how much empathy you show towards them things don't work soumya thank you so much walk away <laughs> you need to feel happy you are not we are not here to change the world if uh, people are toxic then you few believe they're toxic just walk away with a smile most important if 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 you want to be successful in life you need to smile more 
if um, if you can't make a change then let it be remember i talked about the concept of let go you need to know when to let go of things there's a lovely book also a book called don't sweat over small stuff it's after all small stuff sometimes toxic people make themselves a small stuff so walk away from small stuff and don't fret over it you stay happy and end of the day you should wake up see yourself in the mirror with a big smile and say man i love myself so that's the best way to live your life and don't try to change everything around you thank you so much srimati i think it's a fantastic uh, uh, experience hosting you and also i think uh, the kind of insights coming from your very illustrious experience i think uh, you know whatever you share i think uh, you know in each one of them there is a uh, very sublime and very very uh, you know uh, i think uh, uh, you know uh, uh, i would say poignant uh, 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 you know uh, uh, what is experience and which is very rare and you know, most of the times you know we don't get to hear that and it looks very simple uh, as simple as you know your grandmom's story to maybe as big as the ceo story i think uh, somewhere i think your ability to correlate both of them is something that i thought as a you know great uh, learning for all of us because putting them on a continuum you know your grandma story and your the ceo story or maybe you would have seen many more ceos yourself not just from your companies but also the rest of the world i think uh, that's a great uh, uh, and very humbling uh, lesson for all of us i'm sure all the participants must have enjoyed as you know uh, you know they you know, they're commenting and i'm extremely sorry that i couldn't relay all the questions because we have uh, i think uh, more than 30 odd questions uh, right now are unanswered uh, uh, i think we need to have a few more sessions so see when we'll come back to it yeah. but nevertheless i would request all of you to get in touch with uh, you can connect her on the little profile i mean uh, linkedin uh, you know site and then i'm sure you can carry forward this wonderful dialogue but the most important thing she's an amazing uh, uh, person because whatever i've seen or uh, on a linkedin page i've been you know every now and then i see i think the kind of uh, words that people use for her as is amazing i think it's a uh, out of sheer respect i don't because you know somebody from the same company i can understand that they they might uh, like to have some uh, you know they'd like to score some brownie points but then if somebody who is not with her if here they they are writing amazing words and uh, about her and that actually tells her about the uh, evolved leadership thank you so much shrimati wonderful you know hosting you are thank you also to your colleague uh, uh, shweta you know for assisting all of us i know for this smooth conduct of today's uh, session and uh, from all of us and from all of our participants thank you so much and continue to inspire all of us i think uh, and that's what we need uh, to do uh, you know to keep seeing you uh, each one of you in the years to come right and i'm extremely sorry that we couldn't take all the questions but i'm sure we will have a, a opportunity to host you once again and then uh, you will have an opportunity to listen to some of our participants as they you know keep moving their uh, in their careers thank you so much thank you, thank you so much thank you best of luck to everyone and uh, happy sunday thank you thank you Thanks. Thank you, Shweta. Thank you so much. Thank you.